Good evening, everybody, or good morning, wherever you may be. I know there are uh, some who are coming on from various places at various times, so God bless you. Welcome to another Berean Bible study, and of course, I'm your host, Granville McKenzie, and happy to share this time with you again today. So let's take some time in prayer before we begin, and let's just devote this time and prayer to the Lord. And Lord, we thank you for another day in your presence. Thank you for another opportunity that we have to gather around your word as your children, your people who you love. And we are so grateful. We are so thankful. We are so blessed to have this privilege and opportunity. And I pray, Lord God, that you will open our hearts and our understanding to your word tonight as we devote this time to you and ask for your help, your guidance, and your uh, teaching. And for these blessings, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so <clears throat> just before I launch into our lesson for this week, I don't know if there's anything from last week that anyone uh, would like to bring up as far as uh, question or concern, and while uh, while you are doing that, and I will need to repeat this, I'm sure, a couple of times, but in light of the question Pastor Adrian asked at the end of our lesson last week, I um, did an addition to our notes, and he was, I just... <laughs> emailed it to him at six o'clock tonight, and he was um, so gracious to upload them uh, to our website. So um, I will be uh, referring to these uh, new notes. <clears throat> uh, and if you have a chance to go onto our site and at least open them up, whether you uh, download them or not, we'll be at page uh, 26. That's where I'll be jumping in so uh, you don't have to do everything but uh, the new section is from page 26 to page 28 and and so please uh, if you have a chance to just jump on there while we are um, possibly going to talk a little bit about last week um, please do so and then we will turn our attention there but if there is any uh, comment or question of anything we talked about last week, please feel free to bring that up now. And I'll uh, just watch to see if there are any hands or unmuted mics. Uh, Brother James, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I'm as we've been going through this study, I see a lot of baptized in um, when referring to the Holy Spirit. And this probably sounds like a simplistic question, but is there a major difference between being baptized in as opposed to being filled with? Um, well, uh, all of these terms are used. Uh, the, the one little um, word that I have mentioned is this little word, N-E-N, -E -N, in, in Greek, <clears throat> that that can be translated in, with, or by. So as interpreters uh, of scripture, we have to kind of figure out from the context of what we are reading, how we would translate this word. And, and that is a job that we absolutely have. Um, so I, I have consistently translated this uh, word as in, uh, simply because when I come to the baptismal pool, I'm baptizing someone in water. So now they are immersed <clears throat> in the water. They are covered by the water. Um, they are, you know, it's, 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 they're in, uh, baptized in, um, in water. So in the same way, when I, I read 1 Corinthians 12, um, uh, I read it, in one spirit, we are baptized into 
one body. And, and so I'm, I'm certainly not going to argue uh, to the death with anyone who wants to use the word with and, and sort of uh, stick to that. But it is uh, a translation um, situation as far as um, uh, a verse like First uh, Corinthians 12 and um, uh, let me see. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, it says, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, and we're all made to drink of one spirit. So I, I, I like that translation, we're baptized into the body, we are baptized into, um, uh, to drink of one spirit. So um, the other uh, place that really comes up, I think, is in um, John chapter one, where, and this is, there are other scriptures, but John chapter one, for example, um, it says in verse 33, I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. So um, now I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. And as I've mentioned a couple of times, I, I like this version because it tries to the best of its ability to, to be as literal as possible um, to, the, to the Greek text. And so, you know, I see this in uh, terminology. So with, um, filled with, I, I have no argument with that. That's also a biblical term. But, but when I'm speaking of baptism, I, I always use the term baptized in the spirit as we are baptized in water. Okay. I guess, I guess for me, the challenge is when you think of being filled with something, it means that there's a possibility that it could be also empty. Absolutely. Right. And yep. so the, the term <laughs> baptized in yep. kind of puts me in a different frame of mind, because yep. if you're baptized into something, mm -hmm. it, it, yeah, it just seems a little bit of a, um, a different wording to use. So that's just kind yeah. of. Yeah, so, so I totally uh, am with you. Uh, you can be baptized in water, but the water isn't in you. And so uh, you can, you know, the, the correlation would be that you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit isn't in you. But the, the, the major point to consider here, as we have uh, discussed from Romans 8, 9, you, we, we cannot be considered Christians without the Spirit of Christ being in us, without the Spirit of Christ, we are not his. So, so that's one of those um, uh, verses that, um, that really uh, uh, speaks to us of, of that. If the, let, let me see if there's another verse I want to mention in that regard. Um, uh, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. That's Romans 8, 9, right? So this is uh, another verse now that's speaking not just of being baptized in, but the spirit uh, dwelling in us. <clears throat> and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So I think I would take Romans 8, 9 as sort of the, the, the real... Um, crux of it that that I have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and certainly the Holy Spirit must be in me if that makes it a little clearer yeah so so I guess then that kind of answers what I was gonna ask you kind of need both then you kind of need to be filled with the spirit and <laughs> be baptized in the spirit because that's that's what I'm hearing as opposed to what we've traditionally heard where while you're filled with the spirit and, and not really make that differentiation between the two. 
Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I would go too far um, down the road. I, I think in our understanding of what is really going on, we, we do know, we, we see terminology of being baptized in the spirit, and we have terminology of being filled uh, with the spirit. So, so I, you know, we, I, again, I, I don't think we need to, to um, go too crazy on that. But, but certainly the point is, we, we need um, to be filled with the spirit. If, if I was going to pick one, I would probably pick that, you know, that, that it's not just uh, being in the spirit, but the spirit must be in us. And, and so the Romans uh, eight uh, scripture is the one that really, uh, really does it for me. Thank you. No problem. As I look to see if there's another question, I will just mention to those who are just joining us, and um, you'll see it in the, the chat. Thank you, Brother James. I have um, asked him to upload our updated notes, and I'll be using that tonight. So um, it is important that you grab a hold of that. And if not, you know, just listen along and you can um, download it uh, at your leisure. We are going to page 26 of uh, these new notes. And I'd like to address the question that Pastor Adrian asked last week uh, when, when he was asking about, uh, hey, what about 1 Corinthians 14 that uh, again uh, speaks of these, the scripture from Isaiah 28. So I will uh, need your help. I, I, uh, wrote up these notes today and so they are certainly not perfect so if there is something that you see that needs to be amended to be changed something that isn't clear please uh, let me know so I'm I'm pretty much going to read through it as I have written it and I, I, I'm very serious I do want you to give me some input because if something isn't making sense to you I, I want to know so that I can explain properly. So I'm on page 26, halfway down the page. Uh, along with the three passages we discussed last week, uh, we were talking last week about why um, tongues was the vehicle that, that was used by God, certainly on the day of Pentecost. And, and I, I tried to uh, explain my thinking anyway that um, on the day of Pentecost, we have these words of uh, uh, tongues being uh, utilized, and also this word uh, mega, as we would say in English, uh, magnifying God, and the exact same words we have in Acts 2 were the same words uh, in Acts 10 when Cornelius, when the Gentiles were brought in, and my point there was uh, that God had to do exactly the same thing, and Luke used exactly the same words. And uh, Peter, uh, when he went back to Jerusalem in Acts 11, said, look, you know, what was I supposed to do? I had to baptize these people who would receive the same gift as we had. And uh, Luke uh, was careful to use the same words. When we get to Acts uh, 19, and the third uh, instance where we see tongues being uh, mentioned in this regard, uh, we, we note that now Luke used the, the word, um, um, uh, again, for speaking in tongues, and then uh, the specific word for prophecy. And uh, my thinking is, is that Luke was, was saying, hey, when God fills someone with his spirit, he can give them from the least to the greatest of the gifts right now. There's no hierarchy of um, uh, people, you know what, if you haven't been in the church for 10 years, you can't get discerning of spirits. If you haven't been in the church for 20 years, you can't get prophecy. You can have from speaking in tongues to prophecy uh, at the moment God fills us with his spirit and as he chooses, he, he will give us whatever gift 
he chooses to give us. So um, along with those passages, uh, Acts 2, Acts 10, and Acts 19, uh, there are some who look at a couple of verses in Isaiah 28 as an Old Testament prophecy that identifies speaking in tongues as an evidential sign that a person has received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Many of you are familiar with this scripture from Isaiah 28, uh, starting at verse 11. Um, For with stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to this people, to whom he said, this is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Now, certainly, as I was <clears throat> growing up, I, I had uh, some very influential people in my life who were very uh, clear in telling me, look, when you re- receive the Holy Spirit, this is God's rest. Um, this is part of the blessing he gives us, a rest for our souls. And, and so I, I certainly just um, took that and was very happy for the, uh, the rest that I did receive in my soul uh, when I had that assurance that I was filled with the Spirit of, of God. And so I, I, I really had no reason to question that until um, I read the, the last few words of that verse, and it said, I said, wait a minute, it said, yet they would not hear. You know, we're talking about in, in that section in Isaiah 28, God teaching them line upon line, precept on precept, here a little, there a little, and, <clears throat> and they, they wouldn't hear. Uh, he talks about speaking um, to them with stammering lips and another tongue, and, and, you know, these are the people to whom he said, this is the rest, uh, and they wouldn't hear. So I thought, well, that's not positive. That's negative. Uh, that's, that's, so let's, let's see. Now, um, Paul quotes these verses in 1 Corinthians uh, 14. And right now I'll read verse 21, 1 Corinthians 14, 21. In the law, it is written, um, and, and this, don't get hung up about that. Um, uh, many folks would just refer to the Old Testament as the law. It was just a, a common term, even though we know it's a prophecy, not from the Pentateuch. In the law, it is written, with men of other tongues, I will speak to this people. And yet for all that, Paul repeats it, they will not hear me, says the Lord. So, um, <clears throat> uh, this bears a little looking into. Uh, Deuteronomy 28 is the first time that this concept is presented in Scripture, and the context is actually very, very negative. Um, if you read Deuteronomy 28, verse 1 to 14, lays out a whole bunch of blessings that God would give to Israel if they would Uh, obey him. When we did uh, the book of Deuteronomy, we went through this um, in detail, but the the whole uh, big point of Deuteronomy is simply that God was saying, look, I'm going to bless you people. I am going to give you everything, and when I give it to you, don't forget me. So uh, you'll remember our time in Deuteronomy. That was God's big concern, and guess what Israel did? They forgot him. Uh, so here, uh, you know, in, in Deuteronomy 28, we have all these blessings in the first 14 verses, but then from verse 15 to verse 68, he gives these detailed descriptions of the curses that they, they would uh, experience if they disobeyed his law, if they started to engage in idolatry. So uh, let me take you down to verse 45, Deuteronomy 28 verse 45. We will start there. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon you and pursue and overtake you until you are destroyed, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which he commanded you. And they shall be upon you for a sign and a wonder. Okay, 
this thing is coming on you for a sign and a wonder and on your descendants forever because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart for the abundance of everything. So God has given them everything and God has given them his commandments. Um, uh, we were speaking recently about the Ten Commandments and how, in fact, the Ten Commandments is a, a marriage covenant. And so, so he's saying in, in Jeremiah, <clears throat> I, I'm a, I was a husband to you, and you forsook my covenant. I gave you everything, and these commandments really are the, the tenets of the covenant of marriage that I had with you, and because you've just despised all of this and turned uh, away from it, verse 48 says, therefore, you shall serve your enemies, whom the Lord will send against you in hunger, in thirst, in nakedness, and in need of everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. Here, here it comes. The Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flies, a nation whose language you will not understand. So he's talking in Isaiah uh, about these um, uh, people, uh, about this stammering lips and another tongue. And when you uh, jump back to see, well, where did, where did this come from? What is Isaiah referring to? He actually is taking us back to Deuteronomy, and we see that this stammering lips and another tongue is actually... Uh, a sign of judgment from God uh, as, as he judges his people with a nation whose language they don't understand. Now, um, while we're there, uh, or while we're on the, the topic, I'm just going to read from you from Jeremiah chapter 5. And so here's another prophet now. We've, we've uh, heard from Isaiah. We just read Moses, and now here is Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 14. Uh, I'll start at 14. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, because you have spoken this word, behold, I am making my words in your mouth fire, and this people would, and it will consume them. The word of God through the mouth of Jeremiah was going to have this, this consuming function um, as far as the people of Israel were concerned. He says in 15, Behold, I am bringing a nation against you from afar, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. It is an enduring nation. It is an ancient nation, a nation whose language you do not know. So again, this um, other tongues, um, just, uh, is, is, is coming up here. A nation whose language you do not know, nor can you understand what they say. Their quiver is like an open grave. All of them are mighty men. They will devour your harvest and your food. They will devour your sons and your daughters. They will devour your flocks and your herds. They will devour your vines and your fig trees. They will demolish with the sword your fortified cities in which you trust. So this thing, again, comes up of a nation who is coming to judge, and, and they're coming uh, with this foreign language, and this is judgment language. This is not at all um, uh, receive the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues, and this is the rest uh, that you are going to receive. This is judgment. Now, um, I'll also take you to Isaiah 30. And I'll start at verse 15. Um, and, and this just gives a little twist, Isaiah 15, 30. Uh, or Isaiah 30, I should say, Isaiah 30, verse 15. Um, so, so these people were going to be judged, but now in this particular chapter, God is giving them a message of hope. So I'm starting at verse 15. For thus... The Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, has said, In repentance and rest 
you will be saved. And quietness and trust is your strength, but you are not willing. As, and you said, uh, no, we will flee on horses, therefore you shall flee. Uh, and we will ride on swift horses, therefore those who pursue you will be swift. So it's just like he was saying in Deuteronomy um, 28, verse 49, the Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, um, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flies. So he's pulling this uh, again out of there. You, uh, you think you're going to flee on your swift horse? Well, they're swift also. Uh, but the Lord was saying in this instance in uh, Isaiah 30, I, I'm not going to leave you to, to die. I am going to protect you. Well, let's jump over to uh, verse uh, to Isaiah 33. Isaiah 33, verse 19. And, and again, you have this, this redemption of God being prophesied. Isaiah 33, 19. You will no longer see a fierce people, a people of unintelligible speech, which no one comprehends, of a stammering tongue, which no one understands. So a uh, couple times here in Isaiah, uh, you see this uh, situation where he is talking about um, other tongues uh, and stammering lips, but this is not at all uh, a good thing. This is a sign of God's judgment on, on uh, Israel. Okay. Uh, let me just stop for a second. Everybody still with me? <laughs> Everybody understanding? I, I don't want to race ahead if you um, have any issues, but, but um, I just want to make sure I'm not losing you. Okay, so I'm, I'm on uh, page 27 now. So God spoke to his people through his prophets, men whose voices could easily be understood. And I will just say, I see there are a number of folks who have jumped on since we started. I have, um, we have some updated notes on, on the website under Berean Bible Study Notes. So if you want to um, jump on to our website and, and go to those, uh, download these new notes, I'm on page 27. And, um, and so I just want to make sure you're all with me. If not, download it after we're done. And I, I just wanted to make sure you would have it in writing. So God spoke to his people through his prophets. And these were men whose voices and language they could understand. And, and as Isaiah stated, God offered rest and refreshing to Israel. And, and Moses in Deuteronomy 28 outlined a host of other blessings awaiting them if they would obey the commandments of the Lord. But instead of obedience, the nation turned a deaf and rebellious ear to him. Therefore, God said, uh, again in, in Deuteronomy 28, I'll speak to you in a language you don't understand. It will be the language you hear when your enemies are overrunning your country. If you're not going to listen to me, well, are you going to listen to them? Well, as we saw, they weren't going to listen to them either. They couldn't even understand them because in spite of the devastation and invasion of war, Israel still would not listen. Uh, read through the book of Judges when you have a, t a chance and you see this played out time and time and time again. Um, they. Uh, they would not listen to the prophets they could understand, and the devastation brought by invaders they couldn't understand was still not enough to turn them from their disobedience. This, this is a sad state of affairs. So the Lord was saying in, in Isaiah 28, I, I, I'm trying to teach you line upon line, precept upon precept. I, I, you're not listening. And I'm going to bring people against you, people uh, of stammering lips and another tongue. And, and, and you are the ones who I wanted to give rest to, 
but you won't take my rest. So this is all not good. So uh, as we have read in Deuteronomy, as we have read in Isaiah, as we have read in Jeremiah, stammering lips and other tongues were always negative signs in the Old Testament, never positive. I, now, again, I know uh, sometimes we read this, and maybe these are scriptures you haven't considered before, but, but this, is, this is what, you know, we have uh, three witnesses here uh, giving us this message. This is not a good message. This is not a positive message. So um, uh, when the Old Testament believers heard the words of the prophets and did their, um, uh, there are, I should say, Old Testament believers who heard the words of the prophets and did their best to obey and live in harmony with God's laws. Therefore, when enemies of unknown tongues invaded, it wasn't assigned to them as believers. They were already uh, listening to God and, and, and doing what they should be doing. Uh, and, and they understood that these people of unknown tongues were enemies that God had prophesied would come and overrun them. So now I'm going to jump to 1 Corinthians 14 and 22. 1 Corinthians 14 and 22. Okay, it says, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. So now, in this context, tongues are used as a sign against unbelievers who will not hear and obey the prophetic word of God, right? So uh, tongues are for a sign. These nations of unknown tongues and stammering lips were for a sign, and not to those who believe, not to those Old Testament saints who were um, trying to listen and obey, it was a sign to the unbelievers of God's judgment, right? That's what we were reading. These stammering lips and people of other tongues were a sign from God of his judgment as these armies came and overran Israel. But prophesying is not for unbelievers. Unbelievers don't believe. But for those who believe, there were those who would hear the words of the prophets and actually obey the words of the prophets and hear what God was saying. So, um, so what we are going to see here in, in well, let me just uh, read through it, and then we'll stop uh, and have a chance to go back over and, and um, consolidate what we're learning. So, um, uh, as explained in verse 23 that we're going to read now, uh, as it was in the Old Testament, tongues in the New Testament is a negative sign to who? Uh, verse 23. Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say that you are out of your mind? So when, now, if, if, if a bunch of saints are together, and they're speaking in tongues, praying in tongues, singing in tongues, um, uh, whatever they may be doing, everybody's cool, right? Everyone knows what's going on. These are believers, and, and people are, are enjoying themselves in the presence of God. But if unbelievers and the uninitiated come in, um, uh, or as, as he says, so um, um, uninformed, or unbelievers come in, they are going to say, what on earth is going on here? These people are mad. So uh, tongues are a sign to unbelievers. Verse 22 says that. But uh, keep in mind that signs can be positive as well as they can be negative. <laughs> the sign, uh, a sign, to, to, just to use the term sign, doesn't tell us what kind of sign it is. So I've just put a footnote there that will give you some examples from the Old and New Testament of some signs that are positive and some signs that 
are negative. So, so as we are seeing now in 1 Corinthians 14, tongues are a negative sign to unbelievers. If they don't know what's going on and they come into the assembly and everybody's just speaking in tongues, they will think these are just a bunch of um, uh, mad people out of their mind. So, um, therefore, you know, when we come together in a church service, um, just um, unbridled, uninterrupted speaking in tongues uh, is neither edifying to believers, apart from the individual speaking, or unbelievers. Uh, so, that's why Paul said, you know, if I'm, uh, if I'm in the church, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding than 10,000 words in tongues, 1 Corinthians 14. So, so now, earlier in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul made the point that speaking in tongues is for personal edification. That's in verse 4. It's for prayer and worship in the Spirit. That's verse 15. And it's for edification of the church if the tongues are interpreted. That's verse 5, verse uh, 12, verse 13, and verse 19. So speaking in tongues has a place in the assembly of the saints um, if it is uh, interpreted. And so, uh, and then he gives the other aspects of how tongues should be used for our personal um, edification, prayer, and worship. Now, uh, prophecy, on the other hand, is edifying to both believers and unbelievers. Verse 22 tells us that prophecy is uh, beneficial to believers. It says, prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. So it's like verse 22 is giving us the kind of Old Testament um, uh, viewpoint. People would not listen to the prophets, and so um, God judged them by people of other tongues. So that carries over into the New Testament and verse 23, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 23 says, yeah, unbelievers, when they hear this, they just think people are out of their mind. Now we come to verse uh, 24 and 25. Uh, and, and so, yes, we see in 22, it's beneficial for believers. And now in 24, it says, if all prophesy. Now this prophecy, as we have read throughout 1 Corinthians 14, is, is that inspired speech from God through the Holy Spirit in the language that people understand in their native tongue. If all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is convicted by all, and thus the secrets of his heart are revealed. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. So this verse describes a prophetic word that God uses as a direct sign to an unbeliever that he knows the hidden secrets of their heart. And he demonstrates his power to expose them, to reveal them to someone who could have no such knowledge. So you see, unbelievers can respond in two ways, right? The uninformed unbelievers can hear tongues and have a very negative response. And, but when prophecy is involved, when now God is speaking through somebody the secrets of their heart, they are forced to acknowledge that God is truly among you. So, um, so are we good so far? <laughs> this, um, that's a lot to digest. Um, Brother Ron, go ahead, please. Uh, you just, I had a question for you. Uh, unbeliever and an uninformed person, would that be the, that wouldn't be the same thing, would it? Um, uh, could well be. But I, again, I think Paul 
you know, he, he kind of likes to elaborate a little bit. So he'll just cover all the bases. Some people are unbelievers. Um, they, in that they have heard the word of God and they know what it says, but they don't believe. Uninformed people could be someone just, you know, walking in off the street, never been in a church before. They don't know the Bible from, you know, um, uh, nursery rhyme. And, and uh, they come in and they just are observing what's going on. So I think there is a difference between an uninformed person who knows nothing of what's happening versus an unbeliever who definitely knows but has chosen not to believe. Okay, thank you. No problem. Okay, floor is open. I'm sure there are those who would like to say something, Sister Susan. I was going to make a comment last week, last week just about um, when God poured out his spirit on the day of Pentecost. Um, though on the surface it kind of looked general, um, it was very, I thought it was a very personal thing because I guess what happened with me in a church service was that a minister that nobody seems to remember <laughs> just one day at Western Road went up and started speaking and just preaching but really what he was doing was I just realized was prophesying to me because he was speaking exactly as you said words that only I knew that were in my mind like exact phrases and words that I had been thinking I've been <clears throat> sorry feeling very down and just kind of you know at a certain point in my life and exact phrases he spoke them and to me immediately I realized and recognized that God really knew who I was God was real so it was a witness to me. And I didn't realize until now that he was prophesying until you just explained that. But that's mm. exactly what happened. Yep. So my faith yep. grew right there. I remember I had tears and I was at the altar and that was it because I knew <laughs> without a doubt that God was real. He knew the thoughts that no one else knew. He knew exactly who I was and where I was. No, no that's, that's fantastic. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure a number of us have had experiences uh, like that, Sister Frederica, I think you wanted to say something, and then maybe you changed right. your mind. But uh, oh, no, no, Brother I, Rudolph, okay. I, I, yeah, I think Sister um, Susan answered your question. I will. I, I I wanted some examples of like prophetic statements. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so you know, um, even before Western Road, when we were on Brownlee Avenue. Um, uh, Elise uh, might remember this, I, I don't know. But I, and I don't expect anyone to remember it but me, <laughs> because it applied to me. Uh, it was a Sunday night, and two guys came to the service, two men. And um, we we'd never met them, of course, at our little church, nobody ever showed up. I don't know why these guys were there. But they started talking to my dad, and they knew all the new PCI folks and missionaries and this, that, the other, and they presented themselves as missionaries to somewhere. I don't know where, I think it was um, um, somewhere in Central America. <clears throat> anyway, um, um, as the service went on, my dad asked one of them to greet the congregation, which he did, and, and everything was fine. Then uh, when the second guy got up, he just looked directly at me, pointed his finger at me, and, and answered three questions that I had been discussing with the Lord that I had not discussed with anybody. Uh, my brother and I were uh, very tight, and we would talk about everything, but these questions, no. Um, I, I was um, uh, the organist at the church, and I I really was thinking, you know what, I need to go down to Jackson College of Ministries under Lanny Wolf and, and uh, really go to school there and, and hone my craft. And he said, stay right where you are. <laughs> and um, you are going to do great things in music. Well, he started with that. And I thought, well, that's a that's a cheap one. You know, he heard me play and I guess he liked it. So he said, I'm going to do great things in music. But, but then he said, your giving is from the right heart. And I was having this big debate with God because the first job he gave me, I was 
you know, tithing at 10 percent. And I said, now, if you give me this other job, I will increase to, you know, a higher percentage. And then if you give me, you know, so I did that. And if you give me this other job, I will go to a higher percentage. And I did that. So the enemy was playing in my mind to say, you're just giving to get. You're not, um, you, you don't really mean this. You, you, you're just looking uh, for God to, to bless you um, financially. And so he said, your giving is from the right heart, which was, again, an immediate um, uh, thing that, that, that grabbed me because this was a, a strong uh, battle I was, I was facing. I won't talk about the, the third one just now. But uh, that, that's just one experience that I've had with, with God directly speaking to me through someone who absolutely had no idea uh, met me for the first time in their, in their life. Uh, Sister Elise. Hi. Um, I, I mean, I've heard some other examples too. Um, you know, somebody sits beside somebody on a plane and a very, not a, what we would call a godly looking person, but who spoke directly to their situation and their family. But I also, but I wanted to ask, um, it, on the book, on the book, on the day of Pentecost, um, and in stories that I've seen, you know, like with the, um, say, Azusa Street or revivals like that, there's stories of people who speak in other languages. In, in other words, they're proclaiming the word of God, but in another language that somebody else in the vicinity understands. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering where that would fall. Is that speaking in tongues with an interpreter? Is that prophecy? Is that what, what would that be? Yeah. So, of course, uh, this is what uh, God used on the day of Pentecost. And as we discussed last week, I think that was a um, uh, cool thing for him to do with all those people in town from all these various places. And uh, I have definitely, um, uh, in fact, um, uh, my brother was telling me one time about an experience he had in university. Uh, they had a, a, a Bible study group, and there was a, a guy there who came, you know, from time to time, uh, wasn't really living for God, uh, but, but he, he came. And so um, uh, someone, a, as they were praying, someone began to speak in tongues. And again, it didn't, um, uh, didn't affect him. Um, they went on. And then whoever was bringing the Bible study that night um, started to read a scripture, uh, at which point this guy realized, wait a minute, the person who was speaking in tongues was speaking in a language. This was a missionary kid who wasn't serving God in Toronto going to school. Uh, he was in wherever they were in Africa. He had learned the local uh, uh, dialect. And when this person was speaking in tongues, they quoted the scripture in other tongues, in a tongue they certainly didn't know. Then when the preacher came up, he read the scripture in English, and that's when it hit this guy that, whoa, uh, this person was speaking uh, the language of my youth. Um, but because he was so familiar with it, it didn't trigger in his mind till he heard it read again. Um, um, uh, my best friend growing up uh, had a similar experience at, at camp. He was speaking in tongues, and uh, uh, gentlemen, some of you may uh, remember Brother uh, Kovac, um, uh, not Kovac, but Kovac, um, he was one of our, our ministers, he was Yugoslavian, and he went to my friend's mom and said, he's speaking um, Slavic, and uh, the Slavic language, and so, so I've certainly had a couple of experiences where um, tongues were spoken and understood by people who spoke those languages. Now, um, the day of Pentecost is the only time that we saw, um, saw tongues used in that way as far, not as preaching, 
but as magnifying God, which led to Peter preaching. And this is something that folks often uh, forget. Um, they weren't preaching in other tongues. They were magnifying God, giving ecstatic utterances of praise to God in other languages. And that set the stage for Peter to preach his Pentecost uh, message. Now, uh, Charles Parham uh, of Topeka, Kansas fame, that's the Bible school where, where they uh, started speaking in tongues in 1901. Now, um, America has a big PR um, machine. And so uh, people often think that this is when people started speaking in tongues in modern times, but um, that's not at all the case. Uh, in England, the Irvingites and others were speaking in tongues many, many years before uh, it was um, common again in America. And, uh, but, but, the PR machine of America uh, really took this forward. But Parham's thing was, okay, we're going to speak in tongues and it's going to be just like um, it was on the day of Pentecost. This will be our tool to evangelize the world. We will be able to go to any country we want and God will inspire us to preach in these languages. And, and so that was a strongly held belief for some time until it became clear that God actually wasn't, um, wasn't doing that. So <clears throat> um, tongues may be used uh, by God to speak to someone in their own native language, but experience has shown us that that is not typically the case, whether in scripture or, or um now in our, our modern time. But it can't happen. <laughs> um, are you okay with that, Sister Elise, before I answer the next question? Yeah, I think, I think so. Okay, so, um, Sister Cox was just asking about uh, Joel chapter 2, and I, I think uh, we... Uh, let me just see if I can refer back to that. We uh, was that last week that we spoke on that. Um, uh, Joel, Joel chapter two is uh, verses. Uh, what verses do we want in Joel two? I guess I better turn there, and I will be able to tell you verse seventeen. 28. Um, okay, just give me a second. Yeah, Joel 2, verse uh, 28. Um, 28 and 29. Um, you can read the notes on this, uh, Sister Cox, on, ver uh, on page 23 of our notes, um, mm -hmm. because what, what happened there is that when the people on the day of Pentecost heard uh, everyone speaking in tongues, they said, of course, you know, well, what's going on? What does, what does this mean? And so... Uh, actually, starting on page 22, I actually have the scripture uh, printed out there and then into Acts chapter 2. So Peter said, these people are prophesying. Now, he used this um, uh, term, uh, it's, it's, it's um, as they were magnifying God and all of that, we talked about that word mega uh, last week. But then when Peter started to preach, he said they're actually engaged in an act of prophecy um, as Joel prophesied they would do. And, and so um, Joel said, I'll show wonders, uh, um, uh, sorry, 28, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams your young men shall see visions, and also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. So 
there are a number of things that Joel said would characterize this outpouring of the Spirit, and Peter grabbed onto prophecy. That's the one he really honed in on as far as what was happening on the day of Pentecost. Um, other things we've talked about, uh, prophetic utterances, secrets of the hearts being revealed. Yes, that absolutely happens to this day, but Peter uh, said, hey, this is what Joel was talking about. I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh, and here is one of the signs that you will see, which is uh, prophecy. So what they were saying in tongues was a sign of their um, a prophetic utterance uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, sir. Uh, does that answer you adequately? Or you know, yes, you know, yes, okay. it does. It does. Oh, Thank okay. you. Okay, great, <laughs> Sister Elise. Okay, so a question on the opposite side now. Um, mm -hmm. So on the day of Pentecost, we know that people are speaking in the tongues of many nations. Mm -hmm. um, we don't. I, I don't know if I've ever heard, but I, I'm thinking there must be, there. Mu I'm assuming there were people who were also speaking in the native language so that those who were native Jerusalemites would have heard them um, extolling so God it, as well. Yeah, it, it, it's possible. Um, I it, it seems, certainly it talks about the, uh, 120, and and it seems that they were all in this state of, um, uh, as as some would call it, ecstatic utterance. And when they asked the question, then Peter addressed them in um, a likely Aramaic. That's the the language that was really in in vogue in Jerusalem at that time. So um, it is quite possible that there were those giving praise to God in their own language. But when the question was asked, people are saying, man, these people are drunk. So whatever they were saying, it doesn't seem <laughs> that there were those at that point speaking in the native language that anyone could uh, register the fact, oh, oh, they're praising God. They just thought they were all drunk people. And then Peter in his native tongue started to explain what was happening to them. Okay, who's next? Uh, Sister, uh, well, Rainford residence. Sister Frederica this time. Okay, all right. Where did tongues as a heavenly quote unquote language come in to play? Um, you know what? <laughs> Where do a, we see that in scripture? Um, you know, you've asked the question and I have, I don't know if I have ever just done a word search to see heavenly or unknown. Um, has anyone ever done that? Anyone have that at your fingertips? Um, we see other tongues uh, listed um, or just tongues. But uh, to be honest, I yeah. can't. Well, Paul talks about if I speak in the tongue of men and of angels. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so um that that might be uh, if someone has another such scripture that would be that would be great but yeah first corinthians 13 is is very much and um master adrian referred to that also so uh, that's that's where we get it sister freddie tongues of men and of angels Acts, it seems like when they were speaking in tongues, it was an actual language itself, yes. an actual earthly language. Yes. <laughs> if, so, if I can say that. So yes, yes. Yeah. Tongues of men. So, so again, um, some could have been, uh, I mean, there are 120 uh, people there. Um, and I don't know if there were people from 120 other nations. So some could have been speaking the languages of the other nations. Some could have been speaking heavenly languages. Uh, in the case of Cornelius and his household, we don't know what languages they were speaking. It certainly seems to me that 
Peter was just sort of hearing something in a language he doesn't didn't understand and realizing that wait a minute this is just exactly what i heard and felt <laughs> on the day of pentecost god is doing the same thing with the gentiles even though there is no uh, record that he understood anything that they said similarly in acts 19 they spoke in tongues and prophesied uh well um there's no uh, record that that um, any of the folks, uh, Paul uh, or Luke or anyone uh, else with them, understood what was being said in tongues. But certainly on the prophetic side, they quickly recognized that these men who previously were showing no signs of having any interaction with the Holy Spirit were now prophesying and and speaking in tongues, and they were. Uh, clearly under the, the power and influence of the Holy Spirit. So um, and now uh, keep in mind also, God can do whatever he wants to do whenever, wherever, for whatever reason. So if he wants all those people on the day of Pentecost to speak in languages, in the lang uh, tongues of men, okay. If he wants everybody to speak in tongues of angels, okay. He can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. But in uh, sort of answer to your first question, yeah, uh, 1 Corinthians 13 uh, does indicate that there could be earthly languages and there could be uh, angelic languages, to be very specific. Uh, Brother James. So just to kind of follow up on her point, to say that somebody speaking in tongues is speaking in a heavenly language is kind of presumptuous then because we just don't know. Right. Right. Um, now, uh, keep in mind, one of the things we really don't want to forget, um, speaking in tongues is an act of faith. You don't know what you're saying. It is an act of faith. Our faith is in this God we are worshiping and opening ourselves to. And we say, and we pray, God, speak through me. We don't know what he's saying. So it is just an act of uh, a, a total faith release uh, of ourselves to the spirit of God. So whether it's tongues of men or angels, frankly, isn't, isn't a concern of ours at all. God will do what he does. And, and as, as part of that, again, in, in Romans 8, he is witnessing to our spirit that we are children of God. And we are crying, Abba, Father. We, we're having this, this uh, intense, uh, beautiful um, family moment with him, uh, father-child relationship with him that is just... Uh, making our souls boil over in ecstasy. And, and so, so we're not thinking, is this uh, tongues of men, angels? Who cares? We have released ourselves in faith to God. He is speaking through us. Um, there are times, uh, I can't tell you this is a theological fact, but I believe this is what happens. There are times that I have gone to prayer, I am praying to a brick wall. I feel nothing. I am just blah. And, and I say, Lord, I clearly, I don't have it. So will you please pray through me? So he starts praying through me in other tongues. And then thoughts start coming to my mind. And I actually think he is giving me the interpretation of the tongues he's speaking through me in prayer. And I'm going, oh yeah, Lord, bless you know that. Oh yeah, take care of this. As I am praying in tongues, I believe he is giving me those, uh, uh, giving me uh, the understanding of what he is praying through me. And I'm glad to see someone else has uh, uh, experienced the same. So it's an act of faith. We are releasing ourselves to God and and, and believing that he is the one who has now inhabited us and is speaking through, well, not, I shouldn't say inhabited us, he's already done that. So, so 
that he is now activating his spirit through us in prayer or, or even in worship and praise. There are times, I mean, I, I love music, as many of you know, and there are times I start to sing in tongues. And, and again, I don't know what I'm saying. All I'm doing is releasing myself to God and saying, I want to worship you. I really want to worship you. So please just have your way. And I start saying, I don't have a clue <laughs> what I'm saying. If this is tongues of men or angels, I don't care. I just know that I am in the presence of God and it is just a beautiful, beautiful uh, feeling. And, and some people, you might, uh, I mean, be on online tonight and you're saying i've never experienced that um uh, for me it was a very personal thing in a very private place when i you know because just my personality i i'm not that demonstrative in public and so in a private place i just reached out to god and said look you know will you please do this and and he just started speaking through me um some people say well it's like stammering lips like a baby just starting to speak uh, it doesn't sound like fully formed words and things of that nature well yes i certainly experienced that and as i grew in my um comfort level to just release myself to god to do whatever he wanted to do um it sounds to me like more fully formed words or whatever language i don't have a clue i don't care i am just releasing myself in faith uh, to the lord and i encourage anyone who hasn't experienced that um, as paul said in first corinthians 14 i really wish you would all speak in tongues because there is a personal edification that comes through that there is an ability to pray according to the will of God that comes with that. There is worship, um, uh, spirit-inspired um, worship that comes from that. Yes, Sister Susan, with melody too. <laughs> you know, hey, all of this, God is so willing uh, and ready to give us if we will just release ourselves to him. And uh, so... That's the long answer to your question, Brother James. Okay, who's next? Oh, okay, so let me just let me just finish this one little section that I have left <clears throat> and uh, and then then uh, I'll be back to questions. Um, this is on page twenty eight. I'm uh, just finishing the one little section I hadn't read on page 28. So, uh, and, and I mentioned it in passing uh, earlier on, some interpreters would further state that Acts 28 verse 12 explains verse 11 and refers to speaking in tongues as God's divine rest and refreshing. But as you'll remember from our discussion, um, God offered his rest and refreshing but they would not receive it. So uh, Isaiah 28, 12 is not uh, speaking of uh, tongues as God's divine rest and refreshing. However, when we get to 1 Corinthians 14, um, we see that, that uh, 14, 4, speaking in tongues is an act of edification. It might not edify anyone else around us, but it builds us up personally and individually. And so um, Paul's desire was that all believers would speak in tongues as he frequently did. He said, you know, 1 Corinthians 14, 5, he said, I speak in tongues more than all of you. Uh, he received and accepted and, and utilized this this. Um, edification and strengthening uh, that God gave him through speaking in tongues, through allowing the Spirit to express himself through Paul in prayer, in worship, and, and, and this is something that he did uh, all the time. Therefore, um, Isaiah 28, 11, and 12 
cannot be considered a prophecy of the events recorded in Acts chapter 2. Uh, so, uh, again, if you read through, through these notes and the updated notes, um, please download them if you've just come on the call uh, lately. Um, there are updated notes on the website that include everything that I have said tonight. And, and so please uh, read through uh, all of this. Now, let me give you a little heads up. I'm out of town next week. So Pastor Adrian is going to be um, uh, teaching. Uh, he, we will suspend our study here until I get back the following week. He will do something else um, because I, I just want to make sure to sort of take this through from the end to the end, from start to finish. So you will have time to read through this and take the time, please. Um, I know what I'm, I, again, it, it's like, where is this guy coming from? Everything he says seems to be uh, so different from what we have heard before. Please read these scriptures. Let God speak to you. I am not trying to browbeat you with anything and say it's my way or the highway. I'm just doing my best to explain what I'm seeing, what I'm reading, what I'm understanding. And as you have questions, comments, um, uh, pushback, whatever, that's what we're here for. It's the Berean Bible study. Search the scripture to see if these things are so. Don't forget that. You have a job to do. And so in a couple of weeks, when I come back, I, I am expecting that you will have some things to say to me and uh, some reaction response. Uh, it's, it could be, okay, I see it, never saw it before, but thank you. Or, hey, what about this? What about that? Uh, and, and we will uh, discuss. Our objective is to learn and to grow together, not at all for um, me, certainly, to tell you um, I'm the pastor, you listen to me, and, and uh, if you disagree or you see something different, um, something's wrong with you. <laughs> That's not the purpose of this time together. So we have a few minutes. So uh, anything else on anyone's mind, Brother James? So um, I'm not sure if you if you covered it, but I, I'm just wondering if you could give your thoughts as to why the church world is specifically the tongue talking church world is specific has specifically picked um, tongues as the sign. Like based on everything you've presented, I. I don't see, I, I'm trying to figure out how we came to that conclusion, and that's what we're sticking with. Yeah. Um, historically, of course, this came uh, from Topeka, Kansas, the Charles Parham's Bible School, and he gave them the assignment to say, okay, you know what, we are not experiencing what they experienced in the book of Acts, and so what is it that we're missing? How is it that we can enter into uh, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And again, um, I don't have it in my hands or I would uh, show it to you. There's a, a, an interesting biography that someone did on Parham's life and, and outlined the fact that he had clearly received gifts of the Spirit, uh, certainly the gift of prophecy and the gift of healing. He was a powerful evangelist. He had a powerful healing ministry. But like so many, he said, well, I want everything that God has for me. And you will find that the people who are closest to God actually feel, you know, oh, I, I'm, I'm not where I need to be. And so they keep pushing to uh, for more. It, it's, it's, that's the way it should be. But at the same time, um, I think that they were losing sight of the fact that God had already blessed them with, with his Holy Spirit to begin their Christian life, as we discussed in Galatians 3, and with gifts of the Spirit and fruit of the Spirit that they were discounting um, just because they felt they they needed more, and God bless them. You know, that is a desire we all should have. So 
in their study, they determined in, you know, and again, uh, this isn't something I can go into to detail in uh, at, at this moment, more than to say that they determined that tongues was the sign um, that someone received the Holy Spirit. They didn't um, look at the fact that there was tongues and prophecy or tongues and magnifying God. Um, I, 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 um, the, the words used as we discussed in Acts 2 and Acts uh, 10 were um, tongues and, and magnifying God, but Peter identified this as prophetic utterances when he explained to the people. And then Acts 19 specifically uh, states tongues and uh, prophecy. So I am not sure why folks have not sort of grabbed on to the fact that it was never, ever only tongues. Tongues was never a standalone uh, 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 expression of the indwelling spirit in, in the three instances in scripture. So, so, but that's what they came up with from their Bible study. Parham and the others just sort of grabbed that. Oh yeah, that's it. So we're going to seek tongues. Well, if you ask God for tongues, he's going to give you tongues. He, he is gracious. He says, desire earnestly the best gifts. If, if we ask, he will give us what we ask for. So Agnes Osman was the first. She started speaking in tongues. Parham, for a long time, didn't speak in tongues. And uh, um, William Seymour, for a long time, did not speak in tongues. But they had just grabbed this as the touchstone. Uh, why has it continued like that? Well, you know what? It's, shall I say, easy, right? It, is, it seems to be an easy way for us to say, ah, that person has received the Holy Spirit, as opposed to receiving the Spirit by faith, as uh, Paul uh, presents in Galatians 3, or to understand that we are baptized in the Holy Spirit as, um, uh, and into the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, or that without the Spirit, we are not His, uh, Romans 8, and continuing in Romans 8, that, that his spirit witnesses with our spirit that we are children of God. And again, some of you have had that thought, that feeling, that incredible um, rush of understanding and emotion that I am a child of God. I am a child of God. It's, it's amazing. His wit spirit witnesses with our spirit that we're his children. And unfortunately, many people have said, no, 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 none of that counts. Um, faith doesn't count. The witness in your spirit doesn't count. Um, the word of God that says you begin in the spirit doesn't count. Tongues is the only thing that counts. I think that is a very unfortunate circumstance, but um, uh, that's what the Bible school came up with in Topeka. And, and it, it just sort of grabbed hold. And, but as I mentioned before, the people who came certainly to Azusa Street, they were pastors, missionaries, evangelists, um, people who had given their lives to God and were doing great work for God, along with others who had no experience with God. But it wasn't just a matter of people coming off the street who had never experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. They were people who were seeking everything God had for them. And if tongues was part of that, they were coming for it. But they, through their, the teaching at that time, I believe that this was the sign, the evidence. And so it was. Uh, Sister Susan. I was just going to say that it reminds me of uh, the scripture that talks about those who are just seeking a sign. You know, they just want to see that visible thing and mm -hmm. you know they're disregarding as you said the other ways that the spirit infills and manifests itself uh, and 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 that is certainly something the book of john for example is full of this um, um it's a book of signs that jesus gave uh, and again there are positive signs there are negative signs but people seek a sign 
And the Jews would say to Jesus, what sign are you giving us that you have authority to cast the um, um, you know, money changers out and all that? There are uh, different times uh, that this sign thing was used. People like that. It's easy. Um, but our approach to God is based on faith, not just signs. It's based on faith. God uses signs, no question. Mark 16 tells us that uh, he, he was going to confirm his word with signs following, and he did. So there is a place for signs and wonders and miracles. Absolutely. Absolutely. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. So it, it's got to begin with faith. So uh, we're going to wrap it up for uh, this session. Again, uh, please download the updated notes, uh, which are on the Faith Sanctuary website. Please remember, uh, Pastor Adrian will be with you next week. So you'll have a couple of weeks to digest uh, what we were talking about. But last word, Pastor Adrian, I, you asked the question last week. Um, how are you feeling that I answer your question? Um, very well, Pastor. You did very well. Thank you. Well, thank you. See, I, I needed that, you know. I needed <laughs> uh, good. Yeah, the, the point is um, to learn, to grow, and to, you know, understand uh, the Word of God more perfectly, I, I hope. So God bless you all. I look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. And thank you, Pastor Adrian, for jumping in to help me out next week.